Well, good morning, everybody. Hope you are doing well. It's good to be with you today. If you've got a Bible, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 34. Welcome everybody in Knoxville. Good to see you guys and connect with you today. So much uh, great stuff is happening in the life of our church. Everything uh, really gearing up for this next season. We got our men's breakfast coming up, uh, small group connect coming up. Next Sunday, we start a new series called Pray First. Uh, really thought coming into this uh, new season school and all of the uh, new season stuff that was uh, that is about to happen, um, a series on prayer would be important because there's so much worry and so much hurry that takes place uh, in this season of our life. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to look at what if what what, what would it look like if instead of our first response being worry or anxiety or or what whatever that our first response was prayer. And so we're going to talk about how to pray, what the, what the priority of prayer looks like. We're going to pray every Sunday specifically for uh, different needs. I believe God's going to do some miracles and do some incredible things. At the same time, um, our worship team has uh, created a, a three-song EP that's going to release this Friday. So wherever you listen to music, I uh, hope you'll download that music and, and use that in your quiet times. It's kind of this folksy kind of country kind of worship music that I really love and it's going to, uh, I think, help you in your quiet time. And so that releases Friday. Um, really, really awesome stuff coming at you. Um, on the morning of April 13th, 1888, a man by the name of Alfred Nobel, who was a Swedish chemist that invented dynamite, uh, he opened up the newspaper and he, he believed that he was going to read the obituary of his brother Ludwig, who had just died. But instead of reading the obituary of his brother, he read the title, the headlines of the paper, which said, the merchant of death is dead. What had happened was the reporter made a really careless error and put the wrong obituary in the paper. Instead of the brother who died and his life and obituary being in the paper, the reporter actually put Alfred's obituary in the paper. And so... Shocked at first, he began to read his own obituary, his, his, his life and, and uh, his legacy essentially in the newspaper. And so as he was reading the paper, he was actually shocked because he learned that he would only be remembered as the merchant of death and destruction. You can imagine his disappointment. And so after reading that article, he was resolved to make clear to the world the true meaning of his life and the purpose of his life. And he would only live eight years after that event, but he spent the last uh, years of his life creating wealth and building structure to be able to create uh, a series of prizes that would be given to the men and women in the world who most benefited mankind. And after his death, his fortune went to this cause. And we know uh, the prize is one of the most cherished prizes in the world, which is the Nobel Peace Prize. You see, it was the journalist who made a mistake that day that actually forced Alfred to begin to think about his legacy. He was forced to be, begin to think about something that we don't often think about in the world unless we come to church regularly and read the Bible. And that is this question that I think every single one of us need to wrestle with, wrestle with and, and think about. And it is simply this. How do you want to be remembered? How do you want to be remembered? I, I think today is going to be helpful in the sense that we're going to learn the secret to leaving a lasting legacy. And some of us, you know, when we think about this, we forget this kind of mentality that there's going to be a day and, and, and right, we don't like to think about this and let, you know, we don't really are forced to think about this unless we read the Bible or come to church mostly. But there's going to be a day when people come to your funeral and somebody's going to get up and they're going to talk about you for about 15 minutes. And at the end of that 15 minutes, uh, I've, I've been to many, so this is typically how it goes and done many funerals. And at the end of that 15 minutes, the, the person is going to say something like this. Well, if I could... If I could summarize Jim Bob's life in one sentence, it would be this. And then in that moment, your life, my life, will be summarized in one sentence. 
And so I wanna ask you today, what do you want that one sentence to be? You see, we're all gonna leave some kind of legacy. Uh, if you live in a moral life, you're, you're gonna leave a, a negative legacy. Uh, for others, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna invest and you're gonna do the things that are necessary in order to leave a, a, a positive legacy. But, but here's the good news. The good news is that you and I have a choice today to decide what kind of legacy we want to lead. In other words, you can start living your legacy today. And that's the title of the sermon. Legacy starts today. So I don't believe any of us can leave a legacy by accident. Right? It's done intentionally. We think about it now. We live for it today. And so no matter what your past has been, no matter what mistakes you've made, you can receive the forgiveness of God today through Jesus and you can start preparing to leave the legacy that you want to leave. Most people don't think about it though. Most people don't start to churn with those deep uh, questions of life until they're 60 plus years old, you know, and they start thinking, man, man, the, 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 I gotta, gotta figure this out. And, but you don't have to wait until that, that date in your life. You can begin now and leave a richer legacy as a result. Now, I know if you're a young person, you're starting to check out. You're like, oh, legacy, I got a long time, right? I ain't got to think about that. I have some 40 and 50 year olds thinking, I don't need this one, I got some time. Now listen, let's just hold on because think of it in terms of, of seasons in life. Because you don't just leave a legacy when you die, you leave a legacy from one season to the next season. So if you're in school and, and you're a student, what kind of legacy do you wanna leave at the school that you attend? You will leave one with the teachers and the friends and the relationships that you develop. You're not gonna be in that job forever. So, so the current job that you have is a season. One day you'll get another job or you'll retire or God will take you somewhere else, right? And so what kind of legacy do you wanna leave in that organization? And so we're, we're gonna think about it in two different perspectives, per, uh, perspectives here because I want everybody to see how it relates. The, the season of life, you're gonna leave a legacy. And, and yes, one day when we die, we're leaving a legacy. And so I think it is important. I think it's vital that we go through and think through this question. So think about it this way. If you wanted to impact the lives of people 100 years from today, what would you do and, and how would you go about it? So if you wanted to impact the lives of people 100 years from now, what would you do and begin to do today in order to impact them? And, and so we might say, okay, well, I wanna build a library and get, get books and create a library for people to, to, to study and learn. I, I, I wanna build buildings and not, you know, beautiful buildings or whatever. I, I wanna write books, I, I, something like that. I wanna create something that will last forever. You know, we, our, our mind might tend to go in that direction. If you wanted to leave a legacy, that impacted people 100 years from now, what would you do? Well, think about this. Jesus actually set out to do that, didn't he? He set out to do something that would impact people 100 years, 1,000 years, 2,000 years after his death and resurrection. But what did he do? What did he do to accomplish such a great legacy, uh, the greatest legacy in the history of mankind and that will ever exist? He didn't build buildings. He didn't build libraries. He didn't create schools or universities. He didn't write books. What did he do? Well, he invested in people. He developed people, right? He discipled a small group of men that, that, that grew and developed and became leaders and planted churches and developed disciples and a movement grew out of those leaders and the entire world was changed forever. You see, here's the good news for those of you who wanna leave a lasting legacy. You don't have to build buildings. You don't have to write books. You don't have to develop universities and schools. Here's what you need to do. The key to leaving a legacy is to develop people. It's to develop people, it's to invest in people. See, that, that is the legacy, right? And, and, and for every single one of us, you have that opportunity to do that. It's not too far in your grasp. And, and I know a lot of people will say, whoa, 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 that's not my thing. I don't develop people. I don't know how to do that. 
right? I'm, I'm not really a leader. I'm just kind of a person. I'm a normal person. But think about it. What, what, are, we, what are we talking about when we say develop people? Well, do you, are, are you called to love people? Yeah. As a Christian, are you called to encourage people to, to, to do what God wants them to do? Well, yeah. You, you know, you, you called to uh, share the gospel? Yeah. Invite people to church? Yeah. You connect them to God? Yeah. Help people spiritually? Help, help people when they're hurting? We called to do that? Yeah. Folks, that, that's essentially what developing people looks like. It's, it's being a Christian. <laughs> This is what we're called to do. This is what the Great Commission is all about, to go and make disciples. It's about you developing people. Now, the way that I do it will be different than the way that you do it in the sense that we're gifted differently. But how you are gifted, you are called, you will be held accountable for the way in which you take your skills and talents and invest into the lives of people. And how well you invest in the lives of people will determine the legacy that you leave. It's not about just leaving a, an inheritance. It's not about building buildings and writing books. It's about how did you help people? This is exactly what Moses did throughout his life. We've been hitting the highlights of Moses's life. Now we're gonna, we're gonna start with his funeral, essentially. And then we're gonna go back and through the, through the life of Moses, we're gonna see how Moses is investing into a man named Joshua. This is a biblical example of what it means to develop people. So let's start in Deuteronomy chapter 34 together. God takes Moses in the first three verses on top of this uh, mountain and, and oversees all of the land that is called the promised land. So this whole time, God is saying, I'm taking them, my people out of slavery and I'm going to give them a land. I have promised them a home in, in a land of their own. And so the people rejected to do that. Remember, they sent the spies out. They rejected to do that. They were afraid. And so God says, fine, for 40 years, you're gonna wander in the desert. You're gonna live here in the desert. This generation is not gonna get to go into the promised land. And so all of the, that generation has died. All of their kids have grown. Now they are the generation uh, that is left. Moses is the only one left. Everybody's died. And so now they're about to go take the land, but Moses himself doesn't even get to go because he, in, in, in one passage of scripture, uh, God told him to command the rock to pour forth water for the people in the desert. And he did it a different way. He kind of took the glory for this miracle and he struck the rock with a rod instead of doing it the way God told him to do it. And because of that, Moses wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. And so, so he is in this passage, his death is imminent, but there is hope because the promised land is still going to be given to him. And this is what the Lord said to him. This is the land. Imagine being on top of a mountain and seeing all this land and God saying, this is the land that I swore to Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob. God is saying, I promise to give you this land. Here it is, right? I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes. Moses is viewing the entire setting, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the place of his, of his burial uh, to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were uh, his eye was undimmed and his vigor unabated. I love that. Like he was still getting after it, serving the Lord, leading, loving life, passionate. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. Life goes on. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded him. Underline that verse. We'll come back to it. And there was, there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses. Here's his legacy, right? Part of his legacy. No one like him whom the Lord knew face to face. That intimate personal relationship that we've talked about. He was committed to a personal relationship with God, seeking God daily. No one like him for all the signs and the wonders that God sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants 
and to all his land and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. So Moses was a deliverer. He delivered the people from captivity and, and he led them uh, through this desert experience. God did incredible things through his leadership. He knew the Lord face to face. But one, one verse shows us something incredibly important that we don't want to miss. Before he dies, it is revealed that something has been happening maybe kind of behind the scenes, maybe not as prominent when all the plagues were coming and, and as they're wandering in the desert and when the Ten Commandments are given and they have the Ark of the Covenant and they put the Ten Commandments in the Ark and all of these miraculous things are happening. Something even, some might say, even more miraculous and thoughtful and important was happening. And that was Moses was pouring into and investing into and developing a man by the name of Joshua. In verse nine, the people of Israel obeyed Joshua. So Moses died, the people obey Joshua. Why? Because Moses had given him this mantle of leadership to take over. The people respected Joshua. They followed him just like they were gonna follow Moses. So my question is, how does this transition happen so well? How, how did it go so well? And, and I think the Bible gives us a ton of evidence that Moses is developing, he is training, he is pouring in to Joshua. And so I think one of the tests of, of, of leadership is, is not how things go when you're there, that's great, that's important, but one of the tests of great leadership is how does the business go, how does the ministry go when you're not there? Some people, I think selfishly, pridefully, revel in the fact that, oh, my business, it'd fall apart if it wasn't for me. Shoot, if I wasn't there, crumble. Gotta have me. Well, I hear someone say that and I think, well, that's not good leadership. <clears throat> good leadership means that I don't have to be there because I've empowered and equipped other people to do what they're good at and they don't need me. <laughs> I have to do my part, but I can step out and they can still make it happen. That's the test of your leadership. If everything rises and falls on you in the organization, then today's message is for you. It's important for you to kind of wake up and realize that whether you think you're a leader or not, you are. And it's important that we see this, I think, because if we wanna leave a legacy, we're gonna to have to learn how to develop people and not just learn, but we have to actually model the life of Moses here. And so how did he do it so well? I'm gonna give you four keys to leaving this legacy. And we'll, we'll keep it very simple, right? And the first one is this, Moses chose to invest in Joshua. In Numbers 11, it says that uh, Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses's aides since youth. So as a teenager, essentially, as a youth, Moses chose to invest into Joshua's life. Right? He's pouring into him from a young age. He chose to do this. Uh, a couple of examples here in Numbers chapter 13. It says that Moses changes Joshua's name. Evidently, his name was Hosea, which means he saves. But he changes his name and, and gives him this, remember the, the, the name Yahweh, this Yahwistic uh, portion, which translates into Joshua, or in Hebrew, it's Yehoshua, which means Yahweh saves. So in a very, very subtle way here, giving him this new name, Moses is actually symbolizing that something great is happening in this relationship, right? Something great about this man as he is being poured into and developing uh, this relationship with him. Another example is in Exodus 24, uh, Moses took Joshua along with him on, on top of the mountain where God speaks to him. But he, it doesn't go all the way up, but he goes up to a portion and, and he's in the vicinity and he is there. He could have taken anybody he wanted. He could have took his, taken his brother Aaron with him, but he doesn't, he takes Joshua. Why? He chose to invest specifically. He chose to invite him on the journey. In Exodus 32, Moses comes down from the mountain. Remember, they were worshiping Baal, the idol. He gets angry, he throws the, 
the, the, the tablets down. Joshua is there. He, he sees the anger. He, he knows what's happening. When Moses goes into the tent of meeting and, and, and is face to face with God, Joshua is right outside the tent. Like he's right there. He witnessed the personal relationship. So my, my encouragement is for you to choose someone to invest in. I think a lot of people are, are just, just, they just fail to, to invite somebody into that kind of relationship. And it doesn't have to be a sheet of paper and a contract that is signed. It doesn't have to be an awkward conversation that says, hey, would you like for me to mentor you into the things of the Lord? No, no thanks. It's, it's uh, hey, I'm going to lead a small group. Would you be my small group leader? Co-leader, I mean. Hey, I'm going to serve on, on Wednesday nights and disciple teenagers. Would you be my co-leader? Hey, I'm going to go on a mission trip. Would you go with me? Hey, what do you, you want to, you want to get together for breakfast on Wednesday mornings at 6 a.m. and go through the book of John together? Just learn. It's really that easy. You'd be shocked at how many people are hungry for somebody to pour into them relationally and spiritually, right? Choose someone to invest in. I think the, the, the problem though is we're not, we don't have time, right? We don't have time. Why don't we have time? We're always in a hurry. We're in a hurry. We rush from one meeting to the next meeting. We rush home to get our kids and rush them to practice and rush them to the games just to run through fast food, to get in our fast car, to live a fast life. And we're rushing, 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 rushing. The problem is spiritual growth uh, doesn't happen fast. A lot of people show up in church. Let's get a good quick sermon, Trent. All right, there we go. Watching that timer and we need to get out of here, right? Give me a quick word, quick worship, quick service. I want to serve, but I want to serve too much. I just, I got to get it because I got to get out. And we got to go do. In fact, you know, you, some, some people are new to FC. So a lot of people don't realize our culture here at the end of the sermon is we sing a song. And that is our time to reflect on the word of God that was preached, to actually do what we had just been challenged to do. And that takes prayer and, and some thought. And so we sing a song to worship God. And we prayerfully think about that. We don't leave when the last song is sung. And I think there's some new people that have come into our church and maybe your last church did that. We don't do that here. So our church isn't for everybody. <clears throat> I get it. But in our culture, it's like we stay till the end. And, and, and we do that because God's not done. He doesn't just microwave spiritual growth. It doesn't, it doesn't happen like that. And so when we pour into people, sometimes we, we're too, uh, we're, we live a life of hurry and rush to actually do the things that is going to actually leave a legacy. We think I gotta build, I gotta build, I gotta have this big inheritance to give away and I've gotta, I've gotta build this business and I gotta do all this. And at the end of the day, nobody cares about that stuff. At, at your funeral, nobody cares. The only thing they talk about is how you impacted them relationally because that's the legacy. That's the legacy, developing people. We can't be in a hurry. Have you noticed that God isn't on your timetable? He doesn't answer our prayers always when we think he should. And he certainly doesn't grow people in your life like you think he should. If you just started coming to our church because your marriage is having troubles and, and uh, you know, a wife, you might be thinking, I got to get my husband in church because God needs to do something in his life. And you think <clears throat> in two months or two weeks, you know, God's going to change your husband and things are going to get better. Let's be serious. Your husband needs way more than two weeks, right? There are issues there. And so it's going to take longer. And we know that on the surface, but practically sometimes we don't live like that because we want it fast. Joshua had been developed for like 60, 70 years. I mean, he doesn't take over in Deuteronomy 34 until he's 80 years old. Right? And so if you're, if you're kind of up in that range, God's not done with you. <laughs> so that's, that's good news. But then secondly, it's taken a while to develop a man like this. It's taken a while to, de to, to develop spiritually. It doesn't happen overnight. And so if you dare leave a legacy that outlasts you, it's going to require more time than you are giving to God today. 
started, though, with Moses making a choice to invest in Joshua. So my encouragement for you is to find a Joshua. Choose someone to invest in. It's as simple at Foothills Church as saying, I want to lead a small group. It's as simple as saying, you know what, I'll I'll be a co-leader of a small group and start the process. It's as simple as starting the journey process, going to base camp and learning the mission of God's church and how you can get involved in camp two and discovering how God designed you in camp three, what it means to be a leader and how to lead people and help people grow, right? These are the steps you can take on this journey. And then it all comes back to being in a small group and leading people and being a co-leader, learning how to do it. I encourage you to step into a small group. If you're new to FC, the way that you did and you, and you came from another church, the way that you did small groups, life groups, Sunday school class at your last church is not how we do them. So I think even our own people, sometimes we get confused with small groups. We think small groups are for friends to hang out and do life together. Now, definitely we're doing life together, but it's not just where friends gather and hang out. You can hang out with friends anytime you want and do things however you want. But the the reality in small groups is that if all you're doing small group is just hanging out with your friends, you lose the development piece. Because when I'm a friend, when I'm shoulder to shoulder, we're just buds, we're just friends. I can't really coach. I can't really disciple, right? Because there's, hey, you're a friend. In small groups, the purpose is discipleship. The purpose is growth. And so for us to be able to help people grow, then, then, then we have to be able to ch- challenge them, right? And this is what we see Moses do. We'll get into that in just a minute. But, but Moses is, is, is pouring into Joshua. You need a Moses in your life pouring into you. And you need a Joshua in your life, somebody that you are pouring into specifically. Here's the second key. The second key is this. Moses gave Joshua opportunities to lead. So you're not hogging all the leadership at work. You're not hogging all the leadership in small groups. You're giving people opportunities to lead and, and, and to be the, be the guy, you know? And that's hard for, for egocentric leaders and, you know, selfish leaders because they want the limelight all the time and they want all the credit. But you're gonna have to, if you wanna leave a legacy, invest in people, give them opportunities. In Exodus 17, there's a battle they're going to, the, the, the Israelites are going to fight uh, Amalek and the Amalekites. And so uh, Joshua is chosen. Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. And Joshua did so, right? He, he was the commander of this army. And they go out and they defeat Amalek. It's a great story. Joshua earns some credibility. Moses earns credibility because he gave him this leadership opportunity. He crushes it. His confidence grows. The relationship continues to move forward. You're going to have to give leadership opportunities to people around you. You're going to have to let them do what you do and not be insecure about how well they're going to do it. This is what it means to invest in people. This is what it means to see them develop. And this is what it means to leave a legacy. Um, If you are hogging all the small group time as the leader, you're missing it. Co-leaders need to jump in there and lead. You need to miss some nights so they can lead on their own. If you're a coach or a ministry leader here in our church, like let volunteers lead. We we wanna call them up so that they they can lead and so that they can have those opportunities. Somebody at work, Somebody that, that, that you see potential in, call them up, give them opportunities, take a risk. Sometimes they might fail. That's part of the process. Through all of these critical moments, um, Joshua is there. Joshua is learning. Moses is committed to Joshua. But here's the flip side. Joshua was also committed to Moses. You see, a lot of times younger protégés like to microwave the process. They don't want to learn they don't, they don't want to put in the time of learning. And so if you're a younger guy, sometimes your pride gets in the way. I know it. I'll do it differently than this guy. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's old, right? I'll do it better, right? That's, that's ego. That's pride. You've got to submit yourself and humble yourself before men and women who have been here and who have done this at work, at church, learning how they have 
uh, gained their wisdom and knowledge, right? And so a commitment from Joshua is important. He's there. So are you being faithful to your boss or do you just criticize them all the time? Are you being faithful to your point leader? Are you being faithful to your small group leader or do you just keep missing? See, this is, this is the stuff that, you know, we, we, we talk about spiritual growth and worship of God. And then when we talk about the practicality of how to actually do it, this is where I lose people. This is where I lose people because we just want to do Sunday. And you're missing a huge part of what it means to have a relationship with God if all you do is rose on Sunday. And if all you do is think church is a one-hour event every week. No, you're missing opportunities to invest and leave a legacy in this season of your journey. I love key number three here. Um, I kind of jumped ahead earlier, but Moses provided coaching when Joshua needed it. So in Numbers 11, we see a story here. Um, Joshua gets upset that there are some other guys in the camp that start prophesying. They start teaching. And, 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 and he, gets a little, he gets a little weirded out by this. And so he says, my Lord Moses, stop them. <laughs> They're talking about the things of God. And only you can do that. You're, you're the guy. We only listen to you. And Moses is like, hey, are, are you jealous for my sake? He said, would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Moses is like, I wish everybody could preach and teach. It'd be great. I wish more people would do it. So chill out, relax. So in the moment, you know, Joshua thinks he's doing the right thing, but he's doing the wrong thing. And so Moses takes the opportunity as the leader to correct him. <gasps> That's rude and offensive. <laughs> That's what our culture is starting to lean towards. It's like, well, the most unloving thing you could do is withhold coaching to the people that report to you at work. Because if you're not going to tell them where they're getting it wrong, who is? Nobody. They're going to keep doing it wrong and eventually get fired or never grow. So, so you've got to start saying, not, here's an example. Somebody in your small group says something inappropriate to their wife. I may not say it in front of the whole crowd, but later on, I'm going to get the guy to the side and say, hey, man, that was inappropriate. You really dishonored her in that moment. That, that's, that's tough. That's going to hurt your relationship. You know, call them up to a higher standard, right? But what do we do as leaders? Sometimes we, we're too afraid. We're unloving because we don't want to offend or hurt somebody's feelings. But this is what a leader does. This is what a coach does. This is what a mentor does. We provide coaching, yes, even in the moment. And so developing people takes honesty. If you're leading a small group, and you don't have or you don't feel like you have permission to speak into the people's lives that you're trying to help, then you need to talk about it and say, guys, here's the deal. I just don't feel like you've given me permission to speak into your life and have a conversation about it. And most likely they'll say, oh, no, 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 we want that. We want that. Yes. Coaches, mentors, they call out blind spots, right? Now, if somebody doesn't want you to call out their blind spots, then they're not a Joshua, it's fine. It's on them to learn. And that's not your job. Your job, though, is to lead those that are under you. And it's your job to lovingly coach them when they're getting things wrong. Why? Because we want to invest and help them. Here's the fourth key. The fourth key is Moses affirmed and commissioned Joshua in front of the crowd. He confirmed him, right, towards the end of his life. We see this taking place. In Numbers 27, we see the, the succession plan that God gives to Moses that, that hey, Joshua is going to take over. So I want you to commission him. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, lay your hand on him. Symbolically, kind of, kind of this is when we, when, when, when guys get ordained into the ministry, this is like that symbolic laying on of hands, uh, of passing on leadership and authority. Make him stand before Eliezer, the priest, and all the congregation. In other words, platform him in front of everybody so that everybody sees that, hey, this is of God. 
This is, this is of, of you, uh, of, of the Lord. Like this is, this is something that we not only support, but we think is God's plan. This is not only God's plan, but we believe in this man, right? That's huge. That's huge. It's weighty. You shall commission him in their sight. You shall invest him with some of your authority that all the congregation of the people of Israel may obey, right? And so, so they, he does this and Joshua takes over successfully. See, God wanted this replacement to, to happen and Moses is affirming Joshua in front of the people. Joshua has the spirit of God on him, right? And so when Moses passes away, he dies, Joshua takes over. It's a seamless succession plan. If you're a business owner and you're not turned on by this message, I'm, I can't help you. I can't help you, right? So here's the question. Who's gonna take over after you leave? Who's gonna take over when you leave that small group or when you leave that phase of your life? Who's taking over? What's your legacy gonna be? I think for each of us, this is the question that I want you to wrestle with. Who takes over when you leave the business, when you leave the department, when your role changes? If the seat is empty and you leave, you missed an opportunity to lead. In Deuteronomy 34, 9, where we started, let me remind you, Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded so he led well. The people accepted Joshua's leadership. Sometimes when the new boss comes in, the new leader comes in, he or she is not accepted so well. Right? People resist that leadership. And part of the reason that Joshua is accepted is because Moses had affirmed him. He had platformed him. He had commissioned him in front of the people. And he had been leading and developing him for 60 plus years. So the people were used to him and the people knew him. This is an incredible succession plan. Oftentimes when great leaders move away, his successors not met with great enthusiasm, but here we see the exact opposite. Let me remind you of a leadership principle today. Leadership is always temporary. Leadership is a temporary assignment. You say, oh no, I'm the, I'm the business owner, Trent. It's all me, I own the whole thing. You're not taking it with you when you die. It doesn't belong to you. Well, I got this inheritance and that's great, but you're not taking it with you. What's it gonna do when you're gone? Hey, this, this is the question we've gotta wrestle with. We wanna leave well, we wanna leave a legacy we are simply stewards of what the Lord has entrusted to us today. I'm very mindful of the reality that I am the temporary pastor of Foothills Church. Someone will replace me. And my job even now is creating the foundation and the structure to allow him to lead well. And the same is true for your business or whatever it is that you're doing. Who comes up alongside of you today? You say, I don't have the power, it's out of my hands. Well, that's not always the case. If you are doing a good job raising up a leader in the organization, it will become clear to the people around you that this person is the one to take over. So here's a recap. If you wanna leave a legacy, you've gotta develop people. Choose somebody, be intentional about it. You wanna go to lunch? Join my small group. Let's go do ministry together. Let's go serve in, in, in guest services or production ministry. I think that's what we're, we're recruiting today. You can sing, you can play instruments. Hey, come, come join the worship team. Bring that person with you, invite them. Secondly, we give opportunities to lead. Then we provide coaching along the way and then we affirm and commission them platforming them. This guy is a great leader, letting people buy into his leadership. When you leave, who's taken over? Who's taken over? Some of you, you don't, you don't want a spiritual leader in your life. And my challenge for you today is you need to be like Joshua. You need to be a guy that will submit yourself 
under the leadership of somebody in our church to help you grow spiritually. Again, easy connection is in a small group. Easily can do that. Some of you are, you don't like to think of yourself as a Moses type, but you are, you're a spiritual leader. And my challenge for you, if you're not leading a small group, is to lead a small group. And don't just lead a small group of your buddies. That's not a small group in our church. That's a buddy hangout group. Hang out with buddies, do life, do great things, but develop people at Foothills Church. And that means get some younger people in your group, pour into them. If you say, I'm not quite ready, but I think I might be one day, say, I wanna be in a small group and I wanna be a co-leader and I wanna learn and I wanna be intentional about this. Here's the great thing about Joshua. Joshua accepted his leadership role. And if you keep reading the the next book, uh, the book of Joshua, you see that he leads the people to conquer the land and the promised land becomes a reality that people live in the land. He is a commander in chief, man. He is a rock star, a, a leader. However, he didn't develop people. The tragic story of the Israelites is that yes, they take the land, but we don't see any evidence of Joshua developing a successor. We don't see any evidence of Joshua leading and developing any leaders. And as a result, we read in Judges chapter two, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord died at the age of 110. That whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. You know what we've experienced in America is exactly what this verse shows us. We haven't had enough men teaching younger men what it means to be a man. We haven't had enough older women teaching and investing in younger women what it means to be a woman. We become hurried and focused on our selfish agendas. And if we've forgotten the one thing, the only thing that will outlive us, and that is the people that you invest in. Let it not be said at Foothills Church that older men aren't investing in younger men and older women are not investing in younger women. May we make the difference and leave the legacy that God is calling us to leave. Amen? Let's do it. Yeah. Help us, Lord. Let me pray for you. Father, Lord, in this time, we give to you Stir our hearts. We have been challenged with your word. Tell us right now, God, what you want us to do with this. Speak to our heart. God, as we sing and worship you, you are not done. You are not done in this place. God, there might be a man or a woman here today that does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. God, I pray you would speak to their heart that they would believe that Jesus is is the son of God that died on the cross for their sin and rose from the grave, giving them the ability to have their sins forgiven and a relationship with God and heaven as their home. Lord, there are men that need to be leading in our church and they're not, convict them. There are women in this church that are not leading and developing and they need to be. Convict our hearts, God, show us the way. We know the practical steps. We need the faith to believe that you're calling us to do this. And so speak to every person in this room today. Speak to those in Knoxville today that have heard what you want us to do. God, let us be faithful. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching this video. We'd love for you to like the video and leave a comment. And we also encourage you to subscribe and click the bell so you never miss a post from Foothills Church. To learn more about FC, just head to our website by going to foothillschurch.com or by clicking the link in the description below.